good evening and uh, good morning, everyone, whichever part of the world uh, you are joining us from. Um, I'm happy to uh, learn that there are over 1,000 participants who have registered for today's meeting, and I hope uh, uh, um, all of you join us today. And um, so I welcome you all to uh, the second webinar of uh, SIOP CEDA project, the Childhood Cancer Early Diagnosis in Appropriate Referral. And today's webinar is on diagnosis and referral of acute leukemias. Uh, joining me uh, today I, I, is my co-moderator, uh, Liz Snyderman. She is a pediatric oncology uh, nurse practitioner from Edmonton, Canada, and she has been in the past uh, the uh, co-chair for the Global Health uh, uh, Network uh, nursing group. Uh, unfortunately, Jorge, Dr. Jorge Cabania from uh, Argentina, who's a pediatrician there, will not be joining us. Um, so uh, just to let you know something about childhood cancer and this project. Uh, so we know that nearly 90% of childhood cancer burden uh, is incident in uh, low middle income countries where outcomes are uh, much uh, poorer in comparison to the uh, excellent survival rates you see in high income countries. And one of the important reasons for this is delays in diagnosis and misdiagnosis, uh, which pose a sig significant problem here. And that results in advanced disease at presentation with its consequent impact on morbidity and uh, mortality. So this project was started with the aim or, uh, that uh, we have delayed diagnosis, under diagnosis, and uh, as per modeling studies, uh, about half the children in some parts, uh, some regions of the world are actually, they go undiagnosed. And the reason for this is, uh, you know, there's a lack of recognition of uh, early recognition of signs and symptoms of uh, childhood cancer, which often mimic other childhood illnesses. And then there are barriers uh, to access prompt consultation and uh, appropriate referrals for care. So with this in mind, to improve outcomes in uh, LMICs, SIOP uh, um, Education and Training Committee with uh, Dr. Mohamed Sagir Khan, who's uh, also here with us, uh, uh, in this webinar, uh, he took the lead and along with the Committee for Education and Training of SIOP, jointly with the IPA, this project was developed and uh, over the last year or so. And it was launched, uh, launched during uh, the last month uh, of cold September. And the aim is to improve awareness and understanding among primary healthcare providers, uh, such as pediatricians, uh, family practitioners and community nurses who uh, are the first point of contact of any sick child. And uh, this uh, webinar will provide practical advice from oncology experts around the world for better knowledge to uh, diagnose children uh, with cancer uh, with a high index of suspicion at the earliest possible stage. And uh, this year is the first phase where uh, six WHO uh, <clears throat> index cancers uh, will be uh, discussed uh, every month, one a month, uh, namely acute uh, lymphoblastic leukemia, Hodgkin's disease, Burkitt's lymphoma, Wilms tumor, retinoblastoma, and low-grade glioma. So as I said, this is the second webinar of uh, the series, and uh, you, want, you can get more information on this project uh, on the SIOP website. So we will have, uh, to, uh, in the first part, three presentations, uh, followed by a panel discussion. Uh, question and answers will be, uh, uh, the audience may please uh, uh, key in their questions in the uh, QA box, and uh, these will be, we'll arrange to have them answered. There will be a sp simultaneous Spanish translation as well, and this CME will be uh, accredited. Uh, I will let you know exactly how uh, you can uh, avail of it uh, at the end of the webinar. So uh, in the first part, we have uh, a case study of a patient of uh, ALL and to show you how diagnosis can be delayed, followed by uh, clinically, uh, clinical guidelines on when to suspect leukemia in children, and followed by an approach to diagnosis, initial management, and uh, appropriate referral of these patients. So uh, I now uh, invite uh, Dr. Shweta Palla, uh, who is uh, who represents the SIOP uh, Young LMIC group, and she is a fellow in pediatric oncology in India. Dr. Shweta. A very good evening to all the panelists and the audience. Myself, Dr. Shweta from India. Today, I would be discussing a case of acute lymphoblastic leukemia with a delayed diagnosis on behalf of the SIOP Global Health Network Young LMIC group. 
Coming to the patient particulars, we have a 11 year old boy, resident of Wild, who 20 kilometers from our center, presented to us with chief complaints of pain in bilateral head region with intermittent fever for eight months, difficulty in walking with loss of ambulation for five months. He presented to us in March 2021 with chief complaints of low-grade intermittent fever not associated with a specific pattern. He initially developed pain in bilateral hip region with mild swelling, three months following which he developed pain in bilateral knee joints, which was progressive and severe enough that the child had become bedridden. However, there is no history of redness or swelling or increased warmth over any of the joints noted. There was history of significant weight loss of 12 kgs in eight months, along with history of skin and mucosal bleeds in form of epistaxis in the past. So for the above complaints, this child received alternative homeopathic treatment from his local village with some drugs, most of which contain steroids. However, in view of non-resolution of symptoms, he consulted allopathic medical practitioners since he had predominant musculoskeletal complaints, uh, he underwent an X-ray of lower limbs and an MRI spine, all of which revealed diffuse osteopenia. So possibility of GAA was considered and he was managed with NSAIDs. However, he did not receive steroids or oral methotrexate. On examination, he had a height and weight of around minus 3Z4, suggestive of underweight and chronic malnutrition with something. The BMI was 12.9. On general physical examination, he had failure with multiple petechia on trunk and on systemic examination, her abdomen did not reveal any organomegaly, cardiovascular, respiratory and central nervous system were within normal limits. Musculoskeletal examination revealed that the extension and the bilateral hip joints were slightly restricted because of the pain. However, there was no significant swelling in any of the joints on examination. So in database, we have 11-year-old boy who predominantly presented with joint pains and had history of skin and mucosal bleeds and on examination had failure and petechia. So the initial possibility considered was acute leukemia. So we went ahead with the baseline investigations. Complete blood profile showed that he had anemia with intermittent reports of leukopenia and thrombocytopenia. Bioclinical investigations revealed a raised LDH However, there was no evidence of biochemical tumor lysis. In order to confirm the diagnosis, we went ahead with bone marrow aspirate and biopsy, which revealed around 30% blast, which on flow cytometry belonged to B lineage acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Fish done did not reveal any adverse transfer patients, following which the parents were counseled and the child has been initiated on induction chemotherapy. Moving on, in the subsequent talks, we will learn more from our esteemed speakers and panelists regarding the early diagnosis, management, and referral process for children with acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shweta. This uh, is a classic case uh, uh, where, uh, you know, uh, the diagnosis of uh, leukemia of, uh, in children is confounded by a clinical presentation like uh, juvenile idiopathic arthritis. And what is very significant is uh, often steroids and oral methotrexate uh, are the treatment for this uh, condition and uh, which can kind of push the patient into a partial uh, remission and uh, you know, cause a delay in diagnosis. Uh, so we move on now uh, uh, further and I hand over uh, to uh, Liz Snyderman to conduct the proceedings. Over to you, Liz. Thank you so much, Dr. Rashmi. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Federico Antion. He has been the medical director of Unidad Nacional de Oncología Pediatrica, which is the only standalone pediatric oncology center in Central America for over 20 years. Dr. Antion is also the secretary in the School of Medicine at Universidad Francisco Marroquin in Guatemala as well. He is also one of the founders of the Fundación Ayodami a Vivir, a key institution in the development of a treatment program for pediatric cancer in Guatemala. He's a leader who has improved the care for children with cancer in Central America and beyond. He is going to be presenting to us the when to suspect leukemia in children. Thank you so much, Dr. Antiel. Thank you, Liz. Uh, good morning and good afternoon to everybody. I'm going to share my screen now.
Uh, and let me see. Can you see the slides? Yes. I... yes. Okay. Uh, great. We're going to talk about when to suspect, suspect acute uh, leukemias uh, today. As you have heard the case, it's uh, often we see these cases here also in Central America with a delay, delayed diagnosis. And the first thing I want to emphasize is that acute leukemias compared to other childhood diseases are rare. The incidence is about 33 per million children and adolescents between zero and 19 years old per year. So most pediatricians and practitioners that work outside in hospital setting will see between none and one case of leukemia and lymphoma per year. So you have to have a high incidence of suspicion in order to pinpoint the diagnosis. So leukemias are hidden in other more frequent uh, diagnoses in pediatrics, uh, many of them uh, viral infections or bacterial infections. So it's uh, difficult to suspect initially, and there is a high risk of misdiagnosis that you saw in the previous case presentation. It's very important to have a complete history and physical exam and to have, as I mentioned, a high index of suspicion in order to do an accurate diagnosis. So talking about the epidemiology of leukemias, we can see that for acute uh, uh, lymphoblastic uh, uh, leukemia, there's a peak between two to four years. Uh, in the case of acute myeloblastic leukemia, the peak is early on. Uh, basically, the one first two years of life, then it goes down and continues to be like uh, um, low all throughout life. And also the acute lymphoblastic leukemias continues to have uh, uh, low incidence all through adulthood and late life. Because here you can see the lymphoblasts. This is a sample of... Uh, uh, lymphoblasts that were uh, uh, withdrawn from a patient in a, in a pharesis uh, procedure in a case with hyperleukocytosis. But this blast that you see here substitutes the main components in the bone marrow and the blood. That's the reason why platelets decrease, uh, hemoglobin decreases, and uh, blood counts start, uh, leukocyte blood counts start to increase and infiltrate organs like the lymph nodes, like the spleen, like the liver. So what are the signs and symptoms of acute leukemia? Uh, once again, bone pain, arthritis or arthritis, it's seen in these patients. Persistent fever, uh, lymphadenopathy that persists in time uh, and it's greater than one centimeter and doesn't go away, you have to suspect that there's something more than a simple infection. Hepatosplenia megaly. The persistence of infections despite the use of antibiotics. Sometimes we see that the patients go to the doctor and they're prescribed one, two cycles of antibiotics and the infections don't go away, then start thinking about that there's something like leukemia or lymphoma in the background going on. What are the signs and symptoms of cytopenia? Uh, due to the infiltration of the bone marrow, there starts to be thrombocytopenia, which reflects in petechia, bruising, and bleeding. Anemia, it's manifested by fatigue, headaches, and depending on the degree of uh, 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 anemia, shortness of breath, and also pallor. Lycosatosis with shortness of breath, sometimes uh, neurologic symptoms, depending on the degree of hyperlycosidosis, if it's that the case. So this is a, a, a patient with a, a enlarged lymphomes in the cervical region, in the axillary region, it could be due to a viral infection, but if it doesn't run away, it starts thinking about the acute leukemias and the lymphomas. This is a more prominent case when you see the petechia, this pinpoint a red 
flat lesions that you see throughout the body, or you can see bruising uh, uh, here in the lower extremities of another patient. This should raise a high suspicion that uh, there's a possibility of leukemias. Other signs and symptoms, this is a case with uh, uh, cranial palsies uh, uh, in this patient. You see the deviation of, uh, of, the, of the mouth. Uh, uh, in the case of boys, uh, uh, non-painful heart testicular in, in enlargement, which is the infiltration of the testicles, which occurs around three to 5% of the patients. Patients with mainly a sternal mass could be a sign of uh, acute leukemias and also of uh, uh, lymphomas. Other signs which are not so frequent, you can see also uh, leukemias in the newborn. In this case, we have infiltration of the skin with these nodules in the back and on the scalp of the patient. Uh, most likely in acute myeloblastic leukemias, you can see also infiltration of the gums in the mouth, which is uh, um, more related to acute myeloblastic leukemias. This is a rare case where the patient presented with infiltration of the anterior camera of the eye, as you can see here. But uh, uh, when one thinks about leukemia, one uh, thinks about hyperlipocytosis, but this is not the case. This is uh, 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 an article published uh, uh, back in 2009 where they studied, studied almost 500 patients. And as you can see, around 46% of the cases have white blood cell count less than 10,000. So hyperlipocytosis, or increased white blood cell count is not always the case. Some patients uh, present uh, uh, with pancytopenia. Some patients have higher risk to develop ALL. So if you have some patients specifically more frequently with Down syndrome, Bloom syndrome, Fanconi anemia, taxacetylactyptasia, there's a high risk of these patients to develop uh, leukemias lymphomas. Also, in, in, in the early years, uh, an adectin twin affected with acute lymphoblastic leukemia, it is very likely that the adectin twin, specifically if they are less than one or two years old, to develop uh, uh, the other twin to develop uh, uh, leukemias. Ancestry, this is related to your, your origin. For example, it is very well described that Hispanic patients that have native American ancestry have a higher incidence of acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Um, also environmental factors like uh, radiation, exposure to chemicals, or even other agents of chemotherapy like BP16 or BMM16, achelating agents like cyclophosphamide. We, uh, um, given in other tumors or even in uh, the acute leukemias uh, could be uh, uh, related to the development of secondary leukemias also. This is a patient with Down syndrome. Just for you to remember, this is a patient with telangiectasias in the case of uh, uh, ataxia telangiectasia. When you see the signs, uh, please uh, uh, suspect the diagnosis. And it's very important if you are not sure of the diagnosis, if at all possible, avoid the use of uh, um, steroids, no prednisone, no dexamethasone, no hydrocortisone. Uh, so you can uh, go ahead and re uh, uh, send your patient to the, to, to the hematologist oncologist. So I will finish there. I will stop sharing my slides. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And I will turn it on uh, to the next uh, speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Antion. Uh, that's a very helpful overview and, and a good um, introduction for our next speaker, who is Dr. Ruth Namazi, a pediatric hematologist and oncologist at the Department of Pediatrics and Child Health of Makerere University College of Health Sciences in Uganda. 
She has an extensive research experience in the conduct of cohort studies and clinical trials, and she'll be presenting the approach to diagnosis, initial management, and referral of children with acute leukemia. Thank you, Dr. Ruth. Thank you so much. So I, I will go on to uh, then uh, discuss the approach to diagnosis uh, and the initial treatment that uh, a general pediatrician or a nurse ca can give to a child with acute leukemia or a suspected a child with leukemia and, and then refer uh, to the cancer center. So uh, Dr. Federico has made my work very easy. Uh, uh, acute leukemia can present like any common childhood illness and therefore requires a very high index of suspicion. Uh, for example, in Uganda, our commonest presentation in our cancer uh, acute leukemia patients is fever and anemia, which are also common signs of the infections like malaria that we see. So a high index of suspicion is needed if you're going to make a diagnosis of leukemia in, in these children. So take a detailed history, ask some targeted questions, ask about bone pain, look for uh, the petechi that Dr. Federico showed, look for bone tenderness, hepatosplenomegaly that will help you to uh, nail or to, uh, diagnose uh, acute leukemia. So once uh, you suspect a child uh, has acute leukemia, what investigations do you do uh, as a first uh, uh, a health worker that is coming into contact with this child? So I've categorized these into uh, what I've called baseline and then uh, uh, tests that you can do at the cancer center or at a specialized uh, hematology ward, depending on where, which part of the world uh, you're practicing in, and then other tests that are done at the cancer center for staging and uh, risk stratification. So the first test that is available and very useful is a complete blood count or a full blood count with differential uh, uh, differentials. Please look at the complete blood count in its entirety. Look at the hemoglobin level, look at the white cell count and the platelet count. Like uh, Dr. Federico said, you could have about three scenarios, you know, uh, a raised white cell count with a low platelet count and low hemoglobin, think about leukemia. Or a pancytopenia where all the cell counts are down, you know, you have anemia, you have a neutropenia, oligopenia, or you have a thrombocytopenia, think about acute leukemia. Sometimes, but very rarely, uh, the complete blood count might be normal. I've seen about two or three patients uh, but eventually these developed cytopenias, uh, you know, after follow up. And then uh, you do uh, your basic chemistry uh, tests, like in the, the case that we, was presented, uh, creatinine, urea, potassium, which is important, uric acid and LDH, which are going to be important in uh, certain complications of acute leukemia that we shall discuss later. And the next test or the next uh, investigation that is very useful and is available to uh, uh, a general pediatrician or a nurse is a peripheral blood film. It's a very useful diagnostic tool, uh, which uh, you can easily get at any time of the day, given if, if you have a lab or you have a slide. So you look out for the blasts, okay? So these large cells, blue cells that have, uh, they're round and have a high uh, nuclear cytoplasmic ratio uh, all through. You look, uh, you note that they're bigger than your uh, normal uh, white uh, red cell, and you notice that there's anemia, there is a thrombocytopenia, and the key thing is that you need to have a good stain uh, to be able to see uh, these uh, blasts. But if you have a lab that can make a diagnosis of an infection like malaria, you can actually make a diagnosis uh, of leukemia on a peripheral film. So then once you do that and you suspect and you see the blast, then either at the cancer center or at a specialized uh, hematology center, you're going to do a, a, a bone marrow aspirate, which is really the gold standard for making a diagnosis of, of, of leukemia. And you look still at the morphology, you look, at, you look out for the blast and you look out for other cell lines. And on this sample from uh, the, the bone marrow aspirate, then you go on to look for, do flow cytometry for immunophenotyping, you dis, uh, which is going to tell you if this is a B cell or a T cell, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And sometimes, uh, you know, if there's a bit of confusion, if it is AML or ALL. Uh, the same sample, you can do cytogenetic analysis. Uh, uh, Dr. Federico told us, you know, there's a lot of translocations uh, in uh, acute uh, lymphoblastic leukemia, which are important for risk stratification. And then uh, you go on to do uh, certain other tests like uh, CSF analysis for uh, blasts, which are going to be important in deciding what kind of treatment uh, you're going to give the child at the cancer center. 
So once you've made a diagnosis, or once you've seen blasts on a peripheral film or on a, on a bone marrow, and before you refer the child to the cancer center, I know that there are several challenges, especially in uh, LMIC, that you know perhaps the cancer center is uh, many miles away or is not even available. What can you do? What 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 can what interventions can you give? So early intervention against life-threatening complications is actually life-saving. So you can manage the acute complications because after all, uh, you are trained uh, as, as a doctor or a nurse practitioner. So acute uh, complications such as severe anemia, transfused with packed red cells, take a bit of caution, especially in children with very high uh, white cell counts to avoid uh, a high viscosity and uh, complications in the respiratory system. Transfuse with platelets to control the bleeding. We have seen children bleed to death or get complications, neurological complications because of bleeding. Treat infections as indicated. Fever and infections in children with cancer and uh, leukemia is an emergency. So treat them with anti antibiotics as appropriate or according to your local guidelines. Feeding is important. Children with leukemia have several reasons why, they're not, why they can't feed adequately because probably of the fever, they're unwell, they're bleeding in the gum, so make sure that they are well fed, either mesogastric tube or whatever other modalities are available to you. It's important that you counsel and educate the parents uh, of the children with acute lymphoblastic leukemia because they trust you. You're their first point of contact to the hospital. So educate them about what leukemia is or why you suspecting the child to have leukemia and the fact that you're going to uh, eventually uh, refer them to another center for care. So some of the complications that can come along uh, even before treatment starts uh, is a tumor lysis syndrome that you can treat or even prevent the occurrence of this complication. So tumor lysis syndrome is common and it's because of a rapid cell turnover uh, with lysis of blasts and releasing of intracellular contents into the bloodstream. So you have a release of uh, potassium, phosphorus and uric acid into the, into the bloodstream and this causes uh, several uh, problems they cause uh, the uric acid uh, causes damage to the kidneys. Uh, the potassium can cause arrhythmias that can be life-threatening and the low calcium levels can actually cause muscle cramps and seizures. This syndrome is very common in children who have very uh, high white cell counts. Although we have also seen it happen in, in, in apparently low count uh, leukemia and it can actually occur before chemotherapy. Although of course it's more common once uh, chemotherapy is started. So it's important that you uh, diagnose, and that is why it's important that uh, you start with uh, your chemistry, look at the urea, potassium, uh, and uric acid as, as, as some of your baseline uh, investigations. This syndrome can rapidly progress to acute kidney injury that requires dialysis, and that can complicate uh, things and actually uh, lead to loss of life in children with, uh, with leukemia even before they, they start treatment. So uh, aggressive hydration at three liters per meter squared uh, in about 20, in 24 hours to help really induce diuresis. Try to wash out this uh, contents from the bloodstream. Monitor the, uh, the fluid balance though, don't overhydrate, but make sure that you're actually pushing out as much urine as possible. Monitor the urine output as this can be a very early sign of, of renal failure that will require you to uh, 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 consult nephrology or even uh, institute dialysis. Start allopurino, stop uh, the process with the raspberry case or uh, uh, try to reduce on the amount of, of, of uric acid that is being formed with allopurino, depending on if, of course, where you're practicing from. We don't have a raspberry case in our setting, so you, you use allopurino. Cor correct the localite imbalance, correct the hyperkalemia because it can kill uh, before even the cancer kills. And of course, monitor the, the chemistry, the urea and the creatinine as you plan to refer uh, the child. Another common complication that can occur is upper way obstruction and amidiastinal mass. Dr. Frederick uh, talked about this earlier on, especially in children with lymphadenopathy in the, in the neck. Okay, so ch seven children can present with difficulty in breathing with strider and a puffy face, and they really cannot breathe. And this can rapidly lead to uh, death if you do not uh, do anything. This is the one setting where you are allowed, where you can give steroids, which can be a life threat, uh, life uh, saving. And if possible, if where possible, try to take up a diagnostic sample, try to take up a peripheral film and blood for uh, flow cytometry. And where not possible, it's important for you to save life uh, before you can make a diagnosis. Mediastinomasses are common, uh, especially in adolescents with raised white cell count, uh, but can also present in children with low counts. Please do a chest X-ray just to be sure that you don't have a mediastinomass before you do a test that might investigation that might require sedation. 
because uh, a child can actually die because of uh, upper air obstruction from a mass as you're trying to you know, do a, a, a procedure that requires sedation. So then when do you refer? As soon as possible. As soon as we suspect a child has leukemia, refer them to the hematologist, to the oncologist, or the specialized center. Please do not, uh, uh, you know, uh, monitor them for 24 hours to see response to antibiotics. Sometimes they don't really respond to the antibiotics. So refer them as soon as you suspect a child to have uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, as soon as you see the telltale signs, the complete blood count, as soon as you see blasts on a peripheral film, please refer this child uh, to, to the hematologist and oncologist. And consult as much as possible, consult for anemia that is not explained, consult for thrombocytopenia that is not explained, consult for pancytopenia that you cannot explain. So if you any doubt, please consult the hematology and oncology teams so that the diagnosis of leukemia is made very quickly. Document what treatment was given. Document how much fluid you gave, document that you said allopurinol, but document especially if you needed to give steroids because this has bearing on the risk stratification. And sometimes steroids actually can, you know, uh, reduce the number of blasts and the diagnosis can really uh, be uh, problematic. So please document what treatment was given and uh, give, uh, present the initial uh, treatment or the initial uh, uh, investigations. The initial CBC is important because it will help us in the, uh, as we restratify uh, this child. So thank you so much uh, for this opportunity and thank you so much for listening uh, to this talk. So I will now hand over to the next uh, presenter. Thank you so much and I'll stop sharing. Thank you so much, Dr. Ruth. We are going to turn it over um, back to Dr. Rashmi to introduce the panelists in a moment. Um, but I just wanted to um, invite questions in the Q&A from the audience, which will be discussed by the panels and speakers uh, following the panel um, introduction, as well as some questions may be answered um, directly into the Q&A box, um, and then they will go into the answered section for Q&A. So please do uh, begin to think of questions and, and type those questions to us into the Q&A. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Liz. Um, we now move on to the next uh, part of our program. And before that, uh, thank you to the first two speakers, uh, three speakers for uh, their very practical uh, overview and uh, very pertinent points uh, brought out about uh, diagnosis and confounding uh, uh, and factors which confound the diagnosis of uh, uh, childhood uh, acute a uh, ALL. Now we uh, have a very eminent uh, panel of pediatric oncologists uh, uh, to give us their uh, viewpoints about, uh, you know, uh, how to uh, prevent delays in diagnosis. And we have Dr. Chi Kong Lee from Hong Kong, who is a research professor now at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. He has done a lot of work in uh, childhood ALL uh, and uh, he has been the past president of SIOP Asia. He has also been the vice chair of the steering committee of the CCCG Chinese uh, ALL uh, protocols. Then we have Dr. Scott Howard uh, from USA who is a professor at uh, Tennessee, uh, past secretary general of SIOP and he has worked uh, extensively with uh, various Central American and South American countries, uh, LMICs. Uh, earlier on. And then we have Dr. Robert Kimutai from Botswana. He's a pediatric hematologist oncologist there at the Baylor uh, uh, Bots uh, Botswana Children's Center of uh, Excellence and the Princess Marina Hospital uh, at Gaborone. Uh, so we will start with uh, Dr. Chikong Lee. Uh, Dr. Lee, uh, in your uh, extensive experience uh, in uh, working both in Hong Kong and uh, with the Chinese uh, uh, pediatric oncology groups, uh, what, what would you like to tell us uh, about an early diagnosis and what problems have, you, have they faced, have you faced over there? And uh, what advice uh, would you give pediatricians uh, to enable an early diagnosis? Yeah, thank you uh, for the... Uh... Three speakers have been uh, presenting uh, uh, some of the very typical cases of the ALL. So if uh, patients have the typical presentation, usually it is not too difficult uh, to make an early diagnosis, uh, provided that they have been receiving 
uh, education on uh, the uh, signs and symptoms of ALL. Uh, since ALL, even though we hematology oncologists con consider this is the commonest childhood malignancy, however, it's only happening in about 30 patients per million children. So as uh, in the primary care doctors, they may not be seeing one new case of uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia every year in their practice. So we, we should uh, uh, educate uh, our frontline, especially those uh, primary care doctors about what are the warning signs for these uh, ALL so that they may have to be more aware of uh, these uh, serious illnesses rather than the common conditions they encounter day in, day out. For example, some common viral infections uh, at the beginning, they may be very uh, similar to that of the early case of uh, 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 acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Uh, for infections, viral infections, certainly they can also cause fever, some degree of uh, uh, lymphadenopathy or a mild hepatospinomegaly. However, if the symptoms are persistent, for example, the fever lasting for more than a week, that is something we have to look into more seriously for possibility of uh, a long infectious causes. And uh, the other uh, symptoms that sometimes may also uh, mislead uh, our primary care physicians is the bone pain or joint pain. Uh, this is not uncommon for some of the viral infections. They may cause a transient sinusitis that may cause uh, some degree of joint pain or mild bone pain. Um, so that uh, it is not all the time having a joint pain or bone pain be associated with uh, serious uh, uh, hematological conditions. However, the warning sign is that if they are persistent more than one to two weeks and progressively getting worse. But that is something we have to be aware that this is not something simple uh, uh, viral infection related uh, uh, bone pain or joint pain. And uh, of course, rheumatological conditions have to be considered. Like for, for the first case, uh, that JIA has uh, been included in one of the defensive diagnoses, but we always have to be careful uh, for making a diagnosis of JIA and uh, then sometimes even starting steroid treatment. They can have a prompt response. Actually, all the joint symptoms of fever all disappeared uh, after starting steroid for presumed diagnosis of uh, JIA, but that will cause further delay in ALL. So, I think what the investigations also have mentioned that we we should do uh, appropriate in investigation. Now, for, for the first case, like X-ray and MRI was performed, I would believe that usually that will not be rewarding uh, because uh, the bone changes will be very late. Even though we have seen patients with uh, fracture or collapse of vertebra in ALL, but this is uh, not very common. So more important is to do a complete blood count to look at the smear uh, as what Wolf has been mentioning uh, to, to have these uh, uh, a careful examination of the blood smear. For the blood counts, especially for those uh, with uh, bone or joint symptoms, we have seen quite a lot of these. They do not have very abnormal blood counts at the beginning. Their hemoglobin may be a little bit low. Their white count can be in the normal range the platelet can still be normal or low normal. So it, it can apparently look like so-called normal blood count. But if we perform a bone marrow at that time, usually they will show up the blast in the bone marrow. But with time, with time, even though the first blood count may not be uh, very abnormal, but usually about a week, just like uh, the, the case presented by uh, Dr. Sweza, a week later, the hemoglobin dropped and also the platelet dropped. Once we see anemia and thrombocytopenia, then the I think most of the people will 
uh, will not miss such a case of uh, suspected hem hematological malignancy with two lineages abnormal. I, I think the education to the frontline staff uh, on these warning signs is uh, important and also careful history and uh, uh, physical examination is important and then do the appropriate, not, not to do the MRI, it probably doesn't help too much, but do the complete back count, careful examination of the blood smear may sometimes be more rewarding. So that is some uh, my, my pre, uh, 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 response to, to, the, to the questions on the uh, early diagnosis and not to delay uh, these uh, uh, making the diagnosis of ALL. Maybe I let the others like a Scott or the others uh, to, to, to supplement, yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Lee. And um, as, as I understand that uh, in China, they have been doing these uh, training programs for pediatricians for some years now. And I'm sure that must have uh, helped in uh, reducing the delays in diagnosis, uh, you think? Uh, yeah, I, I, I think having holding regular training programs, the targets should be not just limited to children's hospital or those uh, so-called pediatricians, but rather to the more general. Uh, sometimes it's the general practitioners will, will be seeing these uh, uh, children with such complaints. So they should also be having uh, 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 the education or training on, on this common topic. Right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lee. Um, I will now uh, move on to uh, Dr. Robert uh, uh, Kimutai. Dr. Robert, uh, you have had exp uh, extensive experience in various countries in Africa, as I understand, uh, uh, Kenya, Uganda, as well as Botswana now. And uh, what problems uh, have you all encountered uh, in uh, you know, diagnosing childhood ALL and uh, what would you like to tell us about it? Yes, uh, thank you, Rashmi, and uh, the panelists and the team for, for inviting me uh, to this very important uh, topic. So regarding uh, childhood ALL, uh, thank you to the speakers that have uh, made very clear presentations. I think in the what would appear like classic case is, is not always uh, easy to, to, to diagnose because um, you find a child usually presents with a joint pain and really there's nothing else. You, you may even do the CBCs as had been indicated and uh, maybe classify it as infection or call it a, a viral infection. And then what you, uh, when you give it time to, when you, the disease evolves, it becomes clearer that actually what you are dealing with was not uh, just a simple viral because sometimes they do, actually coexist. So we've seen, uh, uh, I think the typical, what you've almost called the typical case there, but many times also we've seen children who come severely ill with these uh, chest masses or they're bleeding or they have got the loss of ambulation as already, has already been mentioned. And uh, at the outset, some of the things which have pointed uh, pediatricians or clinicians to us is maybe a very high white cell count or uh, just the typical uh, bicytopenia, which has been mentioned, having two uh, cell lines. Uh, and having worked in uh, the different countries, I think that's some of the things that uh, leads uh, the hematologist to be called is maybe the child has required a transfusion or they're bleeding or they have got, uh, when they look in the mouth, there's uh, bleeding or epistaxis, which is uh, unusual. And this uh, prompts the clinicians to call the hematologist uh, to, 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 to give input into what is happening. So for example, uh, in the two programs in Uganda and Botswana, which are uh, both running under the same uh, uh, program, Global Hope, uh, the clinician is usually having the telephone number which can be called 24-7. And uh, the students having rotated through the pediatric hematology oncology, come to recognize that uh, some of this, uh, when they have got any concerns, which may be hematologic, they do uh, immediately call to the, to the pediatrician, I mean, to the, to the ped uh, number, which Robert, uh, is- can you a, put the number in the chat? Uh, <laughs> You're gonna get called from the whole world. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll be able to do that. Uh, let me just thank finish. <laughs> yes, yes, thank you. Yeah, so, uh, so what sometimes we just uh, uh, point out to, 
to, to the clinicians is if you're transfusing a child, at least you really must have a reason why you're transfusing, not to do a repeated uh, transfusion without uh, a reason for, for repeating it. And if a child is bleeding, of course, those are alarming uh, signs. And then um, if, if, you, if a child has got really anything that you feel is not explained, then uh, please uh, feel free to, to, to consult. I think uh, the challenges that we have faced, and I think is uh, much as some diagnostics may appear simple. I think full blood count is fairly accessible, but uh, just the next step, which is uh, looking at a peripheral blood smear is not always easily uh, accessed. And uh, in Botswana, this is the only comprehensive cancer care center in the country. And uh, there are varying levels of access when you go beyond the capital city. So uh, one of the things that we are trying to do is to, to make a program where we can uh, train even the lab technicians to be able to, to look at a smear and identify really abnormal uh, specimen and just call uh, for assistance. Uh, one of the things we are also thinking about is just, I would, can I use the term telemicroscopy or basically sharing images through either WhatsApp or sharing them through take, uh, pictures taken, uh, trying to see whether we can be able to share these uh, images to be able to help somebody who's peripheral and far, because some of the distances in this country are more than a thousand kilometers and you need to give them support to, to be able to, to make a decision quickly on what to do, whether to, to give the supportive treatment that you had, we had recommended or to immediately refer to you or just to discuss the cases. So I know, uh, definitely is uh, difficult uh, roads sometimes lead to beautiful destinations and that's what we are usually trying to achieve thank you all right uh, so thank you i think uh, you all are uh, doing a, a lot of great work in africa and uh, some of the other things that we see in lmic's which can confound the diagnosis of leukemia are like tuberculosis you know because of persistent fever lymph nodes and the other problem, uh, which probably you also must be uh, facing is uh, idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura, where sometimes steroids are given even at a primary care uh, level. So yes, so now uh, we just, we go on to Scott. Scott, I've kept you uh, for the last part of the panel discussion, because I know you have a lot of data from, uh, you have worked extensively with LMICs and you have a lot of data on delayed diagnosis, I know. So uh, uh, we look, we would like to hear from you. Well, thank Scott. you for saving me for dessert, and I really yes. appreciate this yes. uh, this event uh, and everybody coming out. This is really encouraging, and I, I think it's a terrific idea. So I, I raise my coffee cup to Sayap. I'll make it visible in your honor. Um, I, I wanted to remind us of four things that have been mentioned by most of the speakers as we go along, and that is how to recognize an oncologic emergency. Because if you don't make a diagnosis, early diagnosis, we're not talking about you have to make it within one hour. We just mean within a week or two of the patient arriving. Nobody's going to go from stage one to stage four in one week. So what we don't want to have is months and months or weeks and weeks of delay. And we don't want to have a patient who dies of toxic death, of, le of leukemia-related death, before they even get a diagnosis. So the worst delayed diagnosis is when you die first and get a diagnosis after death. That's the most extreme delay. So getting a diagnosis within a week or two is fine as long as you protect the patient from the four emergency or from the many emergencies. And there's so four things that must always be done urgently when you see a new patient and you suspect leukemia. One is a neurologic exam. So make sure their brain is okay and their spine is okay because if they have spinal cord compression or if they have increased intracranial pressure, then it's an oncologic emergency. Number two, blood count. So CBC, complete blood count, you see the anemia, the thrombocytopenia, and the hyperleukocytosis. Any of those three could be an emergency if it's too severe. Number three, chemistry panel. And what are you looking for? Tumor lysis syndrome, uh, just like uh, was discussed. So high, high potassium and high uric acid, oncologic emergency. And um, number four, let's see, is that three? Uh, number four, chest X-ray, uh, exactly. So looking for a mediastinal mass. And number five, the phone of your hematology backup or Robert. If you don't have one in your country, then just call Robert's cell phone over there in the chat um, to get real-time advice. And also, I think all of us are happy to answer email. The trouble is if it's an emergency and the time zone is different, then the email may be delayed 
I think you've all had delayed emails from me for reasons unrelated to time zone. So the phone is better. If it's an emergency, you're saving a child's life. Everyone is happy to answer the phone to save the child's life. So there were a bunch of questions which are terrific. Um, I wanted to expand on uh, one of the questions that Federico answered. How can you have a normal blood count with leukemia? And I like what he said. He said, if it's too early, like the first time you have one leukemia cell, you have a normal blood count. When you have two loose cells, four cells, eight cells, 16, even when you have 100 million leukemia cells, you still have a normal blood count because that would be an MRD negative patient with 100 million leukemia cells. So it's only when the leukemia cells take over 50, 60, 70, 80% of the bone marrow, then you see the thrombocytopenia, the anemia, and the hyperleukocytosis. So there can be plenty of leukemia with a normal, bone, with a normal blood count. So please don't let that reassure you. A uh, second question was testing for G6PD, and uh, the answer is really important. Um, it's yes, if it's a male patient especially because remember it's an X-linked disease. So males are at far higher risk. They can be, uh, it's much easier for them to have G6PD deficiency, but also a high risk ethnic group. So if it's an African origin or Southeast Asian origin, you gotta check if it's a male patient of those two origins. And um, the third one was um, the role of telehealth. So I love what Robert says, it, it, you know, hey, if you take a picture, you can take a picture through the microscope. You can take a picture of the cells and just uh, send it to somebody. You don't have to put the patient's name on there. So you don't have to worry about privacy concerns, which means it can go through WhatsApp or text message, anything you want. Um, so I, I feel like the phone is, is really a powerful tool. And uh, Lichia says, uh, suspected diagnosis um, for prolonged fever. Yeah, perfect. I agree with uh, um, Qigong about the bone pain. We've had four patients who were referred after the rheumatologist gave them steroids and methotrexate. They went into remission of their bone pain because they went into remission from their leukemia. But when they relapsed a few weeks later, months later, from the bone pain and the leukemia, they were much harder to treat. So don't, don't ruin that child's life by too early intervention before they get the correct diagnosis. And um, tumor lysis syndrome in the biochemistry, if the biochemistry is normal, then you can relax and then you have time. Uh, and I think that is it. We have a few repeated questions that came in sort of simultaneously. Um, there have been lots of studies of acute leukemia, early diagnosis versus not. And usually they show that it doesn't affect the prognosis, but this is because of bias, because one type of leukemia, T cell leukemia is usually diagnosed earlier and it has a worse prognosis. So if you have a T cell leukemia and it's diagnosed earlier and you do worse, then you get the feeling that early diagnosis is bad. That's not bad, it's actually the earlier the better. Uh, but for acute leukemia, fortunately, if the patient doesn't die of these four issues, then you can save their life and you can save their life next week. You don't have to save it on Friday night. So I, again, I thank you so much, Rashmi, for inviting me and, and all of you for coming. Really nice, nice session. Thanks, Scott. Is there anything else uh, from uh, your, uh, you know, data that you have been, uh, you know, collecting and analyzing and all those colorful slides that uh, I've uh, often seen? Is there anything uh, related to delayed diagnosis that you can? Uh... Yeah, so much data. So I, I would actually encourage us all to register every patient, no matter how late they arrive, no matter what happens to them. And, and why is that? Because some causes of delayed diagnosis are systematic. And without a deep analysis, you can never improve the system. And so it's the health system that actually saves these patients' lives. So I'm really glad we chose the six index cancers from the World Health Organization Global Initiative, because the idea is to improve the whole system, not just to teach one person. And then as long as they're proactive, if they were the patient was lucky enough to see that pediatrician, they would survive. But if they're unlucky to see the other pediatrician who's not here today, then they don't survive. We've got to do better than that. And so a couple of ways to do better. One is through technology. And, and you're always welcome. Everyone's welcome to the resonance technology, which has some clues in there, like you put in data and it gives you answers, suggestions, graphs, ideas. It's also a good way to track your success. If you're seeing that the uh, diagnostic delay is going down over time, it means you've been doing a great job teaching your pediatricians. You know, the pediatricians across the country are going to somebody else and that person needs to, to educate their network, uh, referral network. So I, I do strongly believe that rigorous and continuous data collection can be supremely useful. And it's not, it doesn't have to be burdensome. This can be just a few pieces of data on each patient, five minutes of data entry, for demographics, diagnosis, and a few things about the referral. The SIAP Global Mapping Initiative, I also want to put in a plug for that because um, 
Latin America is finished, Africa is finished, Asia is pending, and Rashmi has been trying to encourage people to respond. Uh, I know that is never easy, uh, but the SIAP Global Mapping is mapping every place that treats children with cancer. So what could be better than going to the internet, clicking on this open part of the SIAP webpage? You don't have to log in because then it doesn't do any good because the, the target audience is not SIAP, it's everybody else who doesn't know where the places are or who to call. And so then right. they could log in, click on there and see the nearest cancer center. So please do participate when you get the invite. Right. Thank you, Scott. Um, uh, now over to Liz. Uh, Liz, are there any questions that you would like uh, answered further? Yeah, I think there's many questions, um, technical questions in the chat, which um, the panelists and um, expert speakers here have been answering. But I think there's one question from Dr. Michelle Farmer, who is one of our partners from the International Pediatric Association, has posed, which is really interesting, which is what is the role of telehealth or telemedicine in the initial workup of leukemia in children? And she wonders whether this can benefit oncologists and referring physicians, particularly in LMICs. Um, so I'd invite... Um, um, any of the panelists maybe to comment on the role of telehealth or telemedicine um, in supporting the work initial workup uh, for children with a suspected ALL. There's, Scott, a really, there's a really nice initiative in Peru, which uh, they have developed an app that can be used by general practitioners and pediatricians to contact directly any doubt they have with the pediatric oncologists in the referral centers. So this is one example of digital health, not necessarily telemedicine, but communication through an app with the health system within Peru to try to refer the patients earlier. So I think that's an initiative that we should be seeing how we will go and perhaps we can replicate this initiative in other uh, LMICs. Thank you. Yes, it is, indeed, this is a good question. And uh, I think the uh, what we have is not really a formal kind of system, but just a kind of an improvised way to try to be able to communicate with each other and be able to share some of these uh, challenges in trying to, I mean, trying to solve them. Because like mm -hmm. I said, uh, it is the, the, the once, uh, not once, but actually the health workers, they, they're quite familiar with us. The program has been here for, almost 20 years so many people have come to understand that the, uh, if we would like to somebody would like to talk to somebody in the PDH monk we just call this number and that number is quite widely accessible thank you right uh, dr lee is there any uh, data from china because i know china has a very large network of uh, cancer centers and uh, they, they in fact have something like a mapping uh, already in place so uh, does telemedicine have any role there? Are you aware? I think I think telemedicine certainly will be of help in um, early diagnosis of childhood cancer, but it depends on the types of the childhood cancers. For, for solid tumors, we found it very useful, especially when we have uh, the images of uh, some of the CT scan or MRI, these had be shared between the primary or, or the primary care and that of uh, oncologists. And then uh, we, we can uh, help to uh, pick up these abnormalities and provide uh, advice on what are the differential diagnosis and uh, what are the early managements or further diagnostic tests to be performed. But while for acute leukemia, usually it's more straightforward by looking at the uh, for, for the history and field examination, that is something we can communicate no matter it's by phone or by uh, 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 other media. And uh, unless you, you are showing uh, the, the bone marrow uh, uh, smear uh, that can be shared between uh, the two ends, and then you uh, sometimes for uh, more atypical cases that may be of help in making the correct, di accurate di diagnosis. But for acute leukemia, 99% of the chance that they will have a rather typical bone marrow uh, smear with uh, a, a population of uh, blood cells. So uh, it is uh, not may not be so uh, helpful for acute leukemia, 
but certainly getting advice from another doctors. For example, if you have a difficulty in the interpretation of the flow cytometry, certainly that can be shared between the primary and that of the tertiary care center so that uh, an accurate diagnosis, whether this is ALL, AML, or the mixed phenotype, this may, may be of uh, help in such situation, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so even for complications, I mean, uh, before stabilizing a patient, this is what we call shared care in pediatric oncology. So, uh, you know, just telephonically uh, learning how to, uh, finding out how from the, uh, from a center of excellence, how to stabilize a patient before sending, you know, all those kind of uh, things also will uh, help in ALL probably. May, may, um, may I also an answer one of the questions raised by the uh, uh, one, one, one of the colleagues is about yes, the about the mediastinal uh, uh, mass as uh, uh, about uh, a T cell uh, a ALL having a remission at the end of the uh, induction. I, I I will always ask for chest X-ray. We we don't may, may not need to have a CT scan because usually T cell if they have MRD negative or bone marrow remission usually the media spinal mass will shrink down uh, 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 well very nicely so just a chest X ray showing a normal contour I, I think that is good enough we we don't probably don't need to get a very fine details whether uh, it is a CT scan or or other PET scan I, I don't think that is uh, necessary. I also um, think we're never going to answer the many really important and <laughs> excellent questions um, that are still left. So I would invite everyone to join our live leukemia discussions. Um, if you speak English or Spanish, then please come on Friday for English or on, on Wednesday for Spanish. Um, I think uh, a lot of the issues that are being asked really do require a 10 or 20 minute response or a full lecture. Um, so, so please uh, look for those lectures in the networks and look for the real-time support in the, in the meetings. Okay, so I think that we are at the end of our time now. I think Rashmi is just gonna close the session. Um, thank you so much to all of our panelists and to all of our attendees for your comments. So, uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so uh, thank you to, uh, I, I'll just uh, share my screen again, Anilia. Yes, you could. Right. Uh, so uh, thank you uh, to all the participants uh, for joining us today. And um, uh, thank you very much to all our speakers and panelists. It was a, a really lively and uh, important and valuable discussion. Of course, as Scott said, that uh, there are so many aspects and so many layers to managing uh, ALL that uh, you know a, a one-hour uh, webinar is never going to be enough. So uh, for the participants, uh, for the CME credit, you will be receiving a feedback evaluation survey link in the next couple of days. And uh, once you complete the evaluation, you will automatically get your certificate and uh, CME credit. And just to let you know that our next webinar will be on retinoblastoma on the 18th of November. And uh, we hope we will have uh, uh, all of you and uh, even more to join us. So thank you everyone and uh, thank you uh, Sagir and uh, for uh, really organizing this uh, beautifully. Thank you. <laughs>